I remember a long time ago, a little rhyme that actually I found quite frightening. Some of you will have heard this before, and it goes like this. Sow a thought, and you reap an act. Sow an act, and you reap a habit. Sow a habit, and you reap a character. Sow a character, and you reap a destiny. Do you get that? I'll say it again. Sow a thought, and you reap an act. Sow an act, and you reap a habit. Sow a habit, and you reap a character. And sow a character, and you reap a destiny. Now, I'm not quite sure what you made of that when you heard me read that, but that fills me with dread. Because it's telling me that every day is a test of what I will stand on and what my future is all about. In fact, what you can do is you could take my day yesterday, slice it at any point, and as you look at that slice, it'll tell you something about what I'm standing on, what I'm living for, which of course are the things that ultimately lead to our destiny. It's be like there's a hint of our destiny every single moment. And when you bring the Bible's way of looking at life into that, basically every moment is there to help us, well every moment will be there to show us whether or not we're wholeheartedly standing on God's promises or not. Brilliant, let's go on. Go on, Liam, nice and quick, good man. Okay, phase back in, are we ready? And relax. Every single moment gives a hint as to what our destiny will be. And as I thought about that little rhyme, I thought, God help me. Because so much of my life and so much of my days, I seem to sort of phase and just not have him as part of things in one way or another. So today, what we want to do is sow. Today I want to sow a thought that will in some way reap an act that might in some way reap a habit or a character or a destiny and it is simply one thing that I want you to sow, one thought and it's this wholeheartedness wholeheartedness Jamie, you've got to sit still matey, okay? Liam, turn around brilliant, sit round sit round good man, well done this is where the action is fella It's at the front. Don't want you to miss it. And Caleb's a great place to go. Did you hear the story of Caleb? We're going to be finding out more about that. Let me tell you about Caleb. He is three times described as being full of wholeheartedness. And that's why his destiny was secure. Not because he was good, but because... Well, as we'll find out in a minute, because he wholeheartedly clung on to an answer for his need of a destiny. So Caleb was a warrior. No offence, Caleb, at the back, but I found this week that your name means dog. The word Caleb, the name Caleb, he was a warrior and he was a dog and he was a down and dirty dog, a fighter. So I want you to think of Maximus in Gladiator. I want you to think of King Leonidas in 300. Have you seen that? Washboard abs. I want you to think of Dog the Bounty Hunter. Anybody seen that on cheap satellite TV? He dresses terribly, doesn't he? But I want you to think of all of those guys, but add 45 years. Because Caleb, at this point, was 85 years old. So his washboard abs are giving way to wrinkled abs. No offence, Caleb and Ron, but that's probably what you've got. And here we are on his 85th, near enough his birthday, and he had been warring and fighting all his life. He had got scars all over him. Because he was one of only two men who made it from Egypt land to the promised land. Do you remember the story, if you've been watching it, the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston was on the other day, wasn't it? God's people were trapped under the cruel rule of Pharaoh in what country? Egypt. And God heard their cries and says, I will deliver you, rescue you. And he delivers them out of Egypt through the Red Sea and he brings them to himself at Mount Sinai. And after he's rescued them and made them his people, he teaches them what it would look like for them to go on being his people. And he does that at Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. But he doesn't stop there. He makes them his people and then he says, I'm going to give to you a land flowing with milk and honey. It is the promised land. And I will get you there. You're not going to do it on your own. You've got no chance. 
I will get you there. And the big question was, would they believe his promise? And immediately, way back early on at the start of the Bible, we ha- we're shown that actually being related to God is not so much as you try hard and muddle through, cross your fingers and hope that God will be happy with you. It is that you're in a jam and you need God to save you, to forgive you, to call you into being his people and give you the promise of a promised land. And that was Caleb. Now Caleb was spoken of because he was one of only two who made it to the promised land. Do you know how many there were who started out? Probably about 600,000. Two made it. I want what Caleb's got. It wasn't because he was a hero. It wasn't because he was Dog the Bounty Hunter. It was because of something else. It was because he wholeheartedly believed God's promises. So let's see this in, in just three parts. We've got three things from underneath. If you could stick them up here. You kids, you've uh, got... Oh, mm, you could, can you just about see the black? No? Well, I'll have to shout really loud. Three things we're going to see. Firstly, we're going to see the choice of wholeheartedness. Then we're going to see a life of wholeheartedness. And then we're going to see the reward of wholeheartedness. So here we go. Number one. Joshua, sorry, Caleb's choice of wholeheartedness. You can see this in verses 6 through to 9. Now the men of Judah approached Joshua of Gilgal and Caleb son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite. Kenizzite, yeah, that's right. And they said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made their hearts, the hearts of the people, melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day Moses swore to me, The land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance, that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now this would have been a meeting you wouldn't have wanted to miss. You've got all these battle-scarred warriors. So there they were, sort of, you know, there was Caleb walking in. He's been out conquering the lands, and he goes to meet his old mate, Joshua, General Joshua, who has led the conquering of the people. And they are 45 years, or 40 years older than any of the other warriors there. So there's all these beefy warriors who, if you'd seen them walking down Danwood, you'd just sort of think, whoops, a daisy, I'll move over to the other side of the road. They're all listening in to hear what Caleb and Joshua are going to talk about. They're two war veterans. They've had campaigns and injuries. Will they stand there comparing their scars? Ah, that was where I got skewered by an Edomite. That was where the arrow hit me from that nasty Canaanite. Was that what they were going to talk about? No. Caleb came and said, Joshua, do me a favour. Will you remember, remember for me the promise that God made to us? Remember, 45 years ago, he promised to give us a land, fight for us, and get us through safely. Do you remember, Joshua, what happened? Not in Joshua chapter 14, but the book of Numbers chapter 13 and 14. Go and read it later. Do you remember, Joshua, how he sent 12 of us, all leaders of the tribes of Israel, up to the new land... And he said the same thing to us. I'm going to give you this land. Go and scope it out. Do a reconnaissance mission. Check it out. Ready to attack. But I'm going to win the battle and give that land to you. And the twelve of them went up. Joshua, do you remember? And it was great. It was a land flowing of milk and honey. Remember we carried all them big, that whopping great big bunch of grapes. It wasn't a piddly Tesco bunch of grapes. It was a massive bunch of grapes. Two of us to carry it with a lock slung between a log. It was massive. It was beautiful. But do you remember them soldiers, Joshua? Do you remember the massive forces of the Canaanites who were there, all in their f- uh, fortresses and with their military might? Do you remember what happened to the other ten who were with us? Of course you did. And of course Joshua, sorry, Caleb here is recounting what happened when the ten of them, out of the twelve, came back and said, we came, we saw, we bottled it. It's mission impossible going up there and Tom Cruise ain't with us. We ain't got a chance of getting through this, fellas. Tell the nation, we can't do it. We can't take the promised land. Let's be realistic. We've got no chance. And all the people's hearts melted. But not Caleb and Joshua. Of course we can get into the land because God promised it to us. 
And this was jo- uh, Joshua and Caleb's. Amy, be quiet, please. This was Joshua and Caleb's choice of faith. Believe what they saw or believe what God promised. Do you see that? Will they take God at his word? Will I believe my angle and my eyes or will I trust God's promise? Will I have confidence in God? Will I choose in that moment to believe that God can do what he says he is going to do? Will I, will I trust in faith? Will I believe? And of course so many didn't, did they? Now that was Caleb and Joshua. But for those of you who have been coming here for ages, you'll know this. And for those of you who have not been coming so long or perhaps your first time, you need to realise that God has made gospel promises to you Not quite the same as he did to Joshua and Caleb, but he has said this. I promise that if you trust me, I will bring you the forgiveness that you need so you can be right with me. I will make you one of my people even though you don't deserve it. And I will carry you to a promised land that is better than the one that Caleb and Joshua had. And I will do this and achieve this and I will accomplish this great feat through the work of my dear son at at his cross where he died in our place. And of his resurrection from the grave to promise a new life. He is Lord and he is King and he will give this to you if only you will take hold of it. If only you will live by it in the moment, day by day, will this be your great hope? And that's his promise to us. To give us a relationship with him, to fight for us, to defeat our enemies, to make us new, to call us his people and to bring us safe through to the promised land. Do you believe he will do that? We're not at Kadesh Barnea on the, on the entrance of the promised land deciding whether or not to attack. We're here in 2011, 2nd of January and speak and the question comes to us, will we take God at his promise? Will we make a choice to wholeheartedly believe? I love this. Look at verse 7 here. You can see this here. Verse 7. Look. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. According, actually, more close to the original word is according to my heart. The ten saw the same thing that the two saw. But one, the ten didn't see with eyes of faith. The two did see with eyes of faith. You see, the ten saw giants... The two saw mice when compared with God's might. The ten saw strongholds. Caleb saw toy soldiers. The ten saw defeat and slavery. And here was Caleb saying, no, it's victory and freedom because God will fight for us. He was prepared to risk everything for what God has promised him and he did it wholeheartedly. And I wonder whether that's us at this start of the year. As you're listening to this, you'll have one or two responses. You'll either say, this is what I want to be like, or you'll be like, Steve, shut up, I've had enough, I don't want to listen anymore, zip it. The first one is, life of faith. The second one is, the life of the ten, who were destroyed and didn't make it through, simply because they didn't cling on. I watched this morning on the telly, you may have seen it, there's all these floodwaters. Do you see the floodwaters in Australia? An area the size of France and Germany together has been flooded. And you saw the rescue boats and you saw people going to, towards the rescue boat or yelling out to the rescue boats. And they're there. And you can imagine, so there's the rescue boats come up and, and you know, they take a little look and um, they can either wholeheartedly grab onto the rescue boat and receive the mercy or else they can just say, eh. Which are we going to do? God here is saying, I'm making you promises of rescue and new life. Will you grab on wholeheartedly? You'd be an idiot not to. But what made it hard for him? I'll tell you what made it hard for him. It was people, wasn't it? Wholeheartedness and choosing the life of faith is difficult because of the people around sometimes. You see, when Joshua and Caleb came back and said, don't disobey the Lord, trust his promise, what did all the other people say? The ten and the rest of the nation, kill him. Kill him. You see, if you try and live a wholehearted life, whether it's from within your family, or whether it's people around you, or whether it's just the society that will come against you, they will try to shut you up. 
You will have to stand out and be different. You will have to wholeheartedly stand up. You try and live wholeheartedly following God's promises and you will sooner or later be misunderstood, judged, not liked, criticised, called for all kinds, and it might even be from within the people who call them God's call themselves God's people they'll say it's impossible I'm not living like that I'm going to go back to polishing my car and watching me EastEnders and if you try to call them away from that they'll have a go and get in your face why is that? it's because you make them feel bad by your willingness to cling on to God's promises and make them the centre of your life and they may well try and shut you up and the result of it for Caleb's generation was that Hundreds of thousands of them died in the wilderness. Go and look at Psalm 95. It talks about that. It says, Today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart like they did back then. And thousands fell in the desert. Some of you remember the little rhyme. You might have been taught at a junior church when you were kids. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, were the only two who ever got through to the land of milk and honey. It wasn't because they were bigger and better than anybody else. It's simply that they wholeheartedly said, I need to choose to grab hold of God's promises for my life. Listen, I've got two funerals coming up this week. I need no reminder that you do not get out of this life alive. You need a rescue. I need a rescue. And only God can deliver it. Don't be anything less than wholehearted grabbing on. Now, that's my first and my longest one. So if you've been making notes for England there, don't worry, the next two points are a bit quicker. If that's the choice of wholeheartedness, to believe God's promise, to stand on his gospel, sorry, to believe his gospel promises, then second of all, we see what the life of wholeheartedness looks like. Let me read for you verses 10 and 11. Uh, Where are we? Here we go. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me. He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he has said this to Moses. While Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was, I was then. You can imagine, we were all playing on the Xbox the other night and that new Kinect thing. You should have seen the young pups. There was Nathaniel there and Mark and Charlie. They were just, honestly... that bit of boxing, get me an inhaler, Caleb had been there, he'd have whooped him, anyway, carry on reading, now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day, you yourself heard that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said, After, uh, you may remember a few uh, months ago I told you that um, um, according to my mum, my teenage years were summed up by a Queen song, do you remember which one it was? I want it all. I want it all. I want it all. And I want it now. And my mum would say, Steve, you just want anything for the easiest. You just want it, and you want it an easy life, and you want it now. You're not prepared to wait. You'll just get it. And that's the way I think many people just face life. We just want anything for the easiest. Let's get it now. I want it all, and I want it now. But the bottom line is it so rarely meshes up, does it? Life in this world is hard. As someone once said, and I think they had a different four-letter word in it, life is hard and then you die. And that could be said for all of us. But it's particularly so for people who live a life of faith. You see, any which way you try to cope with this life, it's going to be difficult. But if you try to stand up for the king who is rejected, then it's going to be even more so. So that's why if you've been somebody, even in this last year, who's decided to trust Jesus as your king, you've probably already got a sniff of it that it's not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be a battle. The life of faith, trusting God's promise, is going to be a war and a battle. Now Caleb, remember, he was 40 years in slavery in Egypt. Then he was 40 years wandering through the desert. No home to call his own. Always one who was looked upon as not having a land, not having a place of rest. And then this last five years, they've gone into the, the, the promised land and they've been having to batter all the other people who were in there, shift them on as God told them, so that they could take residence up in their promised land. So poor Caleb, he's like the dads here on Christmas afternoon. 
looking for a bit of rest. In fact, rest in the Bible, you can see it there in verse 15, then the land had rest from war. And I say like the dads on Christmas Day, but that's actually not the case. Rest in the Bible is a massive theme. Rest isn't the absence of work. Rest is having peace and the absence of strife. Anybody ever looked down on the kids and said, I'll give it a rest? What are you asking for? The end of strife, the end of conflict, the experience of peace, something of harmony, something of life as it is supposed to be, tensions removed, moved. Ever said to, to somebody, give me a break? Of course you have. Because we have that longing deep within us, don't we? And so did Caleb, and so does the Bible. The Bible tells us that away from God, we are naturally in a, point, a state of conflict and war with just about every element of life, not least of all the people who are closest to us and nearest to us. So for 85 years, Caleb has been battled in this world of restlessness, broken by our sin, and Caleb is standing there as a testimony to all of us to say, the life of faith is going to be a battle. 85 years of war with enemies, within and without. That is the life of faith. That is the life of wholehearted service. And while we not, might not be battling against Canaanites and Amorites and Hittites and Jebusites and all those otherites, according to the Bible, we have our enemies that give us no rest, don't we? We have our enemies, the world, the flesh and the devil. And they seem so powerful at times, don't they? I try to crack that old sin of mine and it just keeps on coming back. I live in a world where it's always seemed to be restless. Wherever I look, I'm only a moment away from grief and stress. And I like to blame other people, but I'm mainly the problem. Because I like people to do what I want them to do. And when they won't do what I want them to do, it's bound to bring conflict. I notice, uh, you probably notice this as well as I have, you notice how hard it is to keep the peace at Christmas? Peace on earth? Not in our family. Give me that toy! Why can't we eat? Sit down and eat your food. Will you be quiet so I can just get a moment's peace? It's hard, isn't it? It's still conflict. You see, in the midst of that, will I battle to say, Christ is more precious to me than me getting my own way? It's hard, isn't it? Because at Christmas time, I just want to be selfish. And Christmas time is like the rest of the time. What about wars and battles with our sin? What about the fact that so often we find coming from our mouth a cruel or lying tongue, tongue that will rip other people to pieces or build up us up and justify us as if we are, well, we're the only holy, righteous and perfect one around. We will tear strips off others and build ourselves up. That's a battle, isn't it, to say No. I need a saviour and I need to be humble and I need his mercy too. What about that desire to just simply live an easy life, do it my way? All of that is a battle. And some of you, I've spoken to some of you in these last couple of weeks, you're like, Steve, I just want it all to be over. I just want a bit of peace and quiet. Why can't it be over? And the life in this world is a faithful battle. And sometimes it looks like we've got no chance and sometimes we cry out, give me a rest. And I was reflecting on this prayerfully the other day, and I was like, if, if this coming year is going to be as much of a battle as last year, I don't want it. I'm not looking forward to this coming year, because it's going to be a battle. Now, I don't think that's a testimony to the kind of year I've had. I think it's just a testimony to the fact that life in this world is just hard. It's full of disappointment. There won't be a single one of you in this room who hasn't been disappointed by something in this last year, in this last week. It's going to be a battle. How are we going to get through? We'll look at Caleb. Verse 10, what does he say? Just as the Lord promised, he has kept me. I don't have to try and do this in my own strength. Verse 11. I am still as strong as the day Moses sent me out. Perhaps he's even stronger. Have you noticed how some believers, their body may get older and weaker, but their hearts get stronger? Because they're more full of God's grace. They base their hope and their joy in him. Verse 12, look at that. He's still got more battling yet to do before he fully gets the inheritance. You can see it there. You yourselves heard that the Anakites were there. Now the Anakites, by the way, they were the guys who did bodybuilding in play school 
who had beer on the cornflakes in the morning and ate steak, steak for lunch and tea. These were tough guys, and what does he say? You yourself heard that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, as he said. I will stand on his promises. He will get me through. He's learned that God will get you through, sometimes on your knees, but one day at a time. And if you're somebody who thinks, how can I get through situation X, don't think about getting through that situation. Think about getting through just the next 24 hours, depending on God. Say, Lord, give me this day, my daily bread that I need just for today. So how is Caleb going to get us through? How is God going to get us through? Well, it's by this. By putting in us a spirit of Caleb, a spirit of wholeheartedness, so that we will fight and war and battle tooth and nail with our God. Some of you are good at flicking up your Bible very quickly before we finish this point. Turn up Romans chapter 6 verse 17. Somebody just turn that up for us. Romans chapter 6 verse 17. Somebody read it for us. Did you hear that? But at one point we were enslaved to, being, to living in a broken world and God conformed us wholeheartedly by showing us Jesus. So that every time you hear Jesus and his salvation and all that he gave for us and the way that he was wholeheartedly for us, suddenly what happens within you? Your shoulders go up, don't they? I know I can stand because he stood for me. Christian can't help but be wholehearted when they hear of Christ. And that's how we'll do it. That's the life of faith. It's a battle. But finally and quickly, I want to take you to what I think is the best bit. The reward of wholeheartedness. Can you see it here in verses 13 and 15? Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord and the God of Israel wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. You notice how they had to put that in, because none of the people living in the land even knew who he was. The biggest enemy was crushed. Anyway, then the land had rest from war. Now it's easy to read this part of the Bible and think, boring. Did you hear the first five verses that John had to read about how the allotment of the inheritance? That's actually what this whole section of the Bible is, about how God comes through with his promise to give people the promised land. And if you read through this in your daily Bible readings, you'll just be like in Snoresville. Unless you actually know the places that we're talking about here, the inheritances that are being given. Have you got any idea how large these areas were? How plush, how beautiful. How, these are the places that the rich people in England would want to go on holiday. You know, you hear about sort of the film stars. They go to, uh, to, to Lake Guarda in Italy. Lake Guarda in Italy is a dump compared with these places. This place is wonderful. And so Caleb gets uh, Hebron. Think the Bahamas. Had he earned it? No. Had he deserved it? No. It was a bit like, say, you know, back at, uh, at school, you do your homework and your maths teacher pats you on your head and say, well done, you've done your homework, which is only what you're supposed to do anyway. Well done, I'm going to give you the Bahamas. <laughs> Caleb knew this was all of grace. God granted them, them something simply because they grabbed hold of his promise that he was a generous God. This wasn't a reward for something that they had achieved. It was a reward for something that God had achieved. Do you get this? If you're a Christian, you don't get stuff because you deserve it. You don't earn the reward. God earns it for you and says, live in it. Because that's his character. And that kept him going. And so he stood before Joshua and said, okay, give me my uh, inheritance. And Joshua said, there you go, you get Hebron. But do you know this? This is wonderful. This will warm your heart. Because one day we will stand before our Joshua, the Lord Jesus, and we will get dished out to us what he has earned for us. Kosh! He'll say, well done. You trusted that I would get you through. 
You battled and clung to my promises when it was hard. You trusted that I am my, a true word, and so there you go, Kosh. Have Brazil. Have Ecuador. And while you're at it, you can have Mexico too. Rage. You didn't return to Egypt. Moment by moment, you battled, holding on, and it was hard, but you trusted me. You loved me more than the things of this world. There you go. Hawaii. And for your summer home, Rach, you can have Alaska. Charlie, Spain and the Costas. Mark, Bootle. Look at verse 15. And then the lands had rest from war. That theme is carried on through the Bible. And it becomes apparent that the rest they had was only a faint echo of a future rest that is available to everybody. Have you any idea the vastness, the opulence, the fullness, the generosity that if you were to have eternity over 10,000 times, you would not plumb the depths of the riches and the joy of rest with God merely for digging in with your nails wholeheartedly and saying, I will stand on his promises. Your battle will be done and you will know the rest of the Lord and you'll be craving it now for this short life but basking in it for all eternity. And so in conclusion, I've encouraged you to make the choice. Believe his gospel promises. I've encouraged you to, in the life of wholeheartedness, to stand on his gospel promises. The reward of wholeheartedness is just to live looking to the fulfilment of those promises. So let me ask you, how are you going to finish? How will you finish? Will you finish? Well, I'll tell you how you'll finish. You'll finish on the basis of how you're responding in this moment now. So how are you responding in this moment now? If it's half-hearted, then it won't cut it. If you're disinterested and more interested in this world and getting home and thinking about what the rest of the day is, then you'll be half-hearted. In fact, the half-heartedness is the easiest thing in the world to be. Because to be half-hearted, all you have to do is do nothing. And just let it slip you by. Don't listen. Don't pray. Don't believe that God is the most precious thing. Don't believe that this moment is significant for the rest of your life. Don't believe that this is the most significant moment in your life up to this point until the next one, which is then the most significant moment in your life. Will you stand on God's promise then? Don't come, don't pray. Don't come and pray during the week. That will be half-heartedness. Will you beg God now, 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 for an undivided heart and say, I don't know what this year is going to bring, but I know that what it will have in me is my clinging on to God and his promises. Lord, help me to be wholehearted for you Help me, Lord, to know and enjoy your promises. Whatever it takes, wherever it leads, Lord, help me to be like Caleb. Help me to know your rescue. Let's pray and then let's sing.